Well, once again, I want to welcome you all here to Big Valley, and again, those of you that are visiting for the first time, man, I'm just really thankful you're here. Welcome over in the venue, and thank you, Brandon, for leading worship, singing over there, and Pastor Joel for leading the venue. And uh, the hundreds and hundreds of you that are online watching right now, we're glad you're with us. And if you're listening on the radio, uh, we're, we're glad you're, you're here. Um, Harry and Huddy, are you in this room? There they are. There's Harry and Huddy right there, my, my two favorite buddies. You guys just had a birthday, right? Ten years old. You want to get up here. Hold them back there, Paul. Hold them back. Have, hey, say happy birthday to Harry and Huddy. Happy birthday, Harry and Huddy. <laughs> Hang on to them, Paul. Hang on to them. I know they're, they're going to be preachers someday. Well, I don't get to baptize very often here. Uh, about a couple times a year, I actually get up in the tank and, and do it. But there, there's nothing like that uh, moment. Uh, nothing pumps me up like hearing the stories of how the Lord has transformed uh, lives. And we're going to baptize a whole lot more people actually on Easter weekend. And it's hard for us to kind of keep up with all the people that are giving their life to Christ. And... Um, who want to be baptized, but I'll tell you what, that, that was an honor to, to do that. Today we're going to talk about uh, one of the most beautiful words found in all of the Bible. It's certainly uh, one of the most profound words in all of the Bible, and that's the word grace. We see the word grace or the concept of grace all throughout the scriptures, but the bummer is, is that too many people, including Christians, uh, even some of you, have little, if any, understanding as to what this word, grace, really means. And one of the reasons people have, a, have such a hard time kind of getting a hold of this word is because it's such a deep word. It's a, it's a complex word. One theologian said this. He said, quote, grace is like a multifaceted diamond. There are many, many aspects to it. There's no single definition to describe what grace is all about. And I, and I agree with that. You know, you, uh, if you have a diamond ring on, or you have a diamond earrings, or a necklace, or whatever, the thing that makes that diamond so beautiful is the fact that it has all kinds of facets on it. And the light comes in and refracts off of all of those facets, and it makes it this beautiful thing. And that's the, the, the same thing with this incredible word called grace. It's multifaceted, and that's what makes it so beautiful, but it's also why it's hard to get a grip on. So what I want to do today is we're going to look at some of the facets that make up this incredible word. Okay, we're going to look at, at uh, God's saving grace, just, just one of the many facets that make up this word. Now, uh, before I get into it, I, I do want to give you some kind of uh, baseline meeting as to what, what, it words, what it means, and I'm going to contrast a couple of words, okay? Here we go. Mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give me what I do deserve, and that's punishment. See, mercy is when God doesn't give me what I do deserve, and that's punishment. Grace, on the other hand, is when God gives me what I don't deserve. And that's blessings. So mercy is when God doesn't give me what I deserve. I deserve punishment. Instead, God gives me mercy. Grace is when God gives me something that I don't deserve, and that's his blessings. One of my favorite definitions of the word grace is, is this. Grace is the face that God wears when he looks at my failures. And I thought about that quote this week, and... I often tell you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well acquainted with my own sin, my own failures. Um, I, I don't always love other people the way that God wants me to love other people. I don't always pull it off right. <laughs> I, I don't always uh, show mercy to other people the way God wants me to show mercy to other people. I don't always uh, show compassion the way God calls me to show compassion. The Bible says that we're to treat others the way we would like to be treated. You know, it's called the golden rule. I, I don't always do that very well. There's sometimes I, I just fumble that. 
The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that kind of stuff. Uh, oftentimes in my life, I, I fail miserably at, at allowing God's power to work in me that his fruit would kind of hang off the tree of my life. And I'm glad that grace is the face that God wears when I fumble the ball, when he sees my, my failures. And let me tell you why this message is so important why it's important that you get a grip on this word grace. It's important because grace is at the very heart of your relationship with God. It's at the very heart of your faith or your belief in God. In fact, I'll go as far as to say you really can't understand the Christian life unless you have some sort of understanding of God's grace or his saving grace. I believe that the greater your understanding of God's grace, the the greater and deeper your relationship with God will be. I believe that the the greater your understanding of God's grace, the more you'll be drawn to God, the the more you'll love God, the more you're going to be grateful to God, the richer your worship will be of of God. I believe that the greater your understanding of God's grace, the more you're going to want to live a life that honors God. You see, one of the reasons why some of you who uh, claim to know the Lord You claim to have given your life to Christ, but for whatever reason, you know, you you, you just don't live a life worthy of your calling. Part of the reason is, is you don't really understand this incredible word called grace. You really don't have a a, a grip on it. But there's one big, huge problem that we here in America face as it relates to really getting a grip on this word grace, and that's what's commonly called the American work ethic. You've probably heard it. The American work ethic. The American work ethic basically teaches that you get what you pay for in life. It basically says that there's no such thing as uh, free lunch in this life, right? It says you have to work hard if you're going to make it in this life. But for those of us that have grown up under this mentality, according to the Bible, God doesn't operate on the American work ethic. In fact, this mentality actually keeps a lot of people from relating to God. It it keeps people from experiencing a deep relationship with God because they think that somehow God has this same mentality. Beloved, the Bible tells us something way different about God. The Bible says that God works from a, a different mindset. He works from the mindset of grace, not the American work ethic, as good as that is in some areas. That is not the mindset or the mentality that God has. The Bible says this in Psalms 86. He says, but you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love and and faithfulness. We're told all throughout the scriptures that God is a gracious God, which means that when it it comes to your relationship with God, you got to get the American work ethic out of your mind, especially as it relates to your salvation. Now, I think most Christians understand the concept that we're saved by grace. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter two, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by work, so that no one can can boast. Most believers have that verse memorized. Out of all the verses that are in this book, that's one of the the weighty verses in all of the Bible. And usually at some moment in your Christian journey, you memorize Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved. But I've discovered that many Christians, although they, although they, they know that they're saved by grace, they don't act like it. They don't live like it. Instead, they spend most of their life thinking and acting like they're saved by works. The American work ethic somehow enters in to the picture. For many of you, even though you know you're saved by grace and you know that you don't get into heaven by doing good, your entire life is built on pleasing God. Your entire life is all about trying to be perfect. In other words, you're you're working real hard to somehow maintain your salvation. 
You go about life thinking that God has some cosmic clipboard and he's walking around going, oh, okay, that was good. Oh, that was good. Hey, that was good. Oh, that was bad. That was bad. That was bad. Oh, wait a minute. That was good. That was good. And that there'll come this moment, you know, where you'll be standing before God when you take your last breath here and God's going to go, okay. Oh, good, 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 good. Oh, a lot of good there. Bad, 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 bad. Oh, too bad, too many bad. Down elevator. You don't, you don't get to go. Bummer. <laughs> and what's sad is some of you live like that. You, you, you think God's just kind of following you around with the clipboard, right? And he's just watching your life. Okay, that's good. That's, oh, man. That's bad, man. And at some moment, you know, he whips out the, 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 the final test when you get there, and you go, whoa, whoa. I know verbally you say that you're saved by grace, but too many of you live a life of works. Yes, you believe in God's saving grace, but you've added the element of works to the equation. And in my opinion, it's not only destructive, but it's also demonic. And it's a horrible way to live. And I want you to know there are some preachers that actually will, 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 will teach the fact that you have to work hard to maintain your salvation. In fact, there's some guys right here in this town that will teach that. They're evil. They're wicked. I've actually met with one of them. And um, I was very thankful that the Holy Spirit within me gave me a lot of self-control. Because I just wanted to stand up and <laughs> and I'm not kidding you I wanted to do worse than that because he's evil he's an evil man evil listen when you really understand God's saving grace it'll revolutionize your life because it'll bring a whole new depth to your life I know some Christians that literally have walked with the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years, and yet they still have little or no concept of what it means to live by grace, which is one of the reasons why I believe that the Lord led me to do this message in, in, in the series. Okay, because when you get it, when, when you truly understand the, the grace of God, I want you to know your life will never be the same. Your life won't be the same. Your family won't be the same. Your worship of God won't be the same. How you view things, just, it just won't be the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few truths from God's word about his saving grace, okay? These truths tell us how we can know for sure that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. Now, here's the deal. Everybody in this room, everybody over in the venue, if you're watching online, listening on the radio, the, we're all going to die. Death is the great equalizer in life. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter, you know, how much money you got in the bank. You're going to die, every one of you. Now, I know for those of you that are young, you don't think about that kind of stuff. When I was young, I, I didn't think about that kind of stuff. But I've been here at Big Valley Grace for 30-plus years, and uh, part of my job is I have to do funerals. And I've done the funerals of people that have lived to be 100. I've lived, done funerals of people that have lived to be 90 or 80 or 70 or 60. But I've also done the funeral of, of teenagers, people that were in high school. I've done the funeral of some who were in junior high. I've done the, some, the funeral of some who were in elementary school. Unfortunately, I've done the funeral of some that only lived a day or two or even a minute or two. See, in my world, I understand this idea that we're all going to die. At some moment, you're all going to stop breathing. I don't know when it'll be, but you will die. And these truths that I'm going to share with you are the truths that really will set you free as it relates to what happens to you when you die. How can you know for sure that when you take your last breath here on planet Earth, you'll spend your eternity with the Lord in heaven? So, so here we go. N number one. Saving grace, this facet I'm going to look at, is a, a free gift to God, from God to you. Saving grace is a free gift to you. God just gives it to you for free. Romans chapter 3 says, everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Everybody in this room is in the same boat. We've all sinned, we've all blown it, we've all said things that we know were wrong, we've done things that we know were wrong, we've thought things that we know were wrong. All of us in this room, we've sinned, we've blown it. 
There isn't anybody in this room who would stand up and say, well, I haven't. I've lived a perfect life. I've never had a bad thought. I've never done a bad deed. I've never said anything crummy. Nobody would, could, could do that. Nobody. And if you did, all we'd need to do is ask your spouse, is that true? And then it'd be settled in, in, a, in a moment, right? right? Just ask your kids or whatever. We've all blown it. We've all sinned. And all of us need to be made right with God. How? By his grace, which is a, a free gift. Our sin separated us from God. And the only way we're made right is by, by his grace. And he just says, it's free, here you go. I got a gift for you. My saving grace. It's a free gift. Beloved, the only way that that you and I are made right with God, the only way we can have our sins forgiven, the only way that we're ever going to get into heaven is by God's grace, which is a free gift. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. God simply offers it to us for free. But because of the American work ethic, many people are, are deceived into thinking that they're saved by their good works that they somehow have to earn their way to heaven, that if they're you know, good enough someday when they die you know, and they're standing there before God, God's gonna say to them, hey, come on in. You worked really hard down there on planet Earth. You did a lot of really good things down there. And because you worked so hard and because you've been so good, I have no choice but to allow you into my heaven. Some people believe that. Some people base their whole life on that. Beloved, the Bible clearly says that salvation is a, a gift, a free gift. And last time I checked, you don't have to work for a gift. If you have to work for a gift, it ain't a gift. Look, if you've got a birthday party coming up and you invite somebody over and they show up and go, hey, I got you a gift, and you start to take it and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I need you to go mow my lawn first. <laughs> you invited the wrong buddy over. That ain't a gift. A gift is a gift. You don't have to earn the gift. You may not even deserve the gift. A free gift is just that, it's free. And if it's not free, then it ain't a gift. God says that you're made right with him simply by his grace. You can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can't work for it, it's free. In fact, this is the, the fundamental difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world today. I don't care if it's Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Roman Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, or whatever. They're all based on works. There are certain things that you do in order to gain God's approval. It just varies from one religious group to another. And you don't have to like what I just said, but you know what I said is just is true if you're a part of one of those groups. Christianity, on the other hand, is the only religion that's built on this beautiful word called grace. You don't do anything because everything you, you needed was done on the cross by Jesus Christ. He paid for your salvation. He paid for your sins. He did everything. It's all been done. Nobody else, there's not another religion on the planet that teaches that. I had a guy ask me one time, Pastor Rick, what can I do to be saved? And I said to him, hey, look, man, I got some bad news for you. It's too late. And I could tell that he was really bummed out. And he said, what do you mean it's too late? And I said, look, man, you're about 2,000 years too late. What needed to be done for your salvation has already been done. And there's nothing you can do to add to it or take away from it. Jesus Christ already did it. He paid for your salvation on the cross. And now he simply just offers it to you as a free gift. You see, the American work ethic somehow gets into our lives and we think, well, I have to do, no. A free gift is just that, it's a free gift. In John chapter 19, we get to hear the very last thing that Jesus said while he was hanging on the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. 
And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And I'm probably going to look at this verse on, on Easter weekend if God doesn't come back. Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He didn't say, I am finished. And the reason why he didn't say, I'm finished, is because God isn't finished. Jesus isn't finished. He's still at work in people's lives today. He's in, at work in my life. He's at work in the lives of those that have been baptized here all weekend. Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And the question you got to ask yourself is, what's the it? What is finished? Beloved, what is finished is the plan to save you from the penalty of your sins. That's what's finished. The plan to provide saving grace for everybody. God said it is finished. Here it is. I've, I've done it all. And, and now I just offer it to you as a free gift. Here it is. God says, here. It's finished. I, I've, I've done it. It's, it's a gift. It's free. You, you can't earn it. <laughs> and you certainly don't deserve it. It's a free, free gift. We sang that great song that Christians have been singing for a long time called Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, a lot of times we sing these songs and they're just words. And we forget the theological truth that, that they're based on. Some churches can't sing that song. That, that church I'm talking about here in town, and there's more than one of them, couldn't sing that song. Or they could, they just had to change the words. What can wash away my sin? Well, Jesus' blood and a bunch of good things I do. What, you know, what can make me whole again? Well, the blood of Jesus is good in some of these other things that I do. They couldn't sing that song in all reality. They don't believe that the blood of Jesus is good enough. Friends, saving grace will be the greatest gift that will ever be offered to you. We've all been, been offered some unbelievable gifts in our lives. I've received some unbelievable gifts in my life. But the greatest gift that you will ever be offered will be God's saving grace. Some of you are here today just so that you would hear that. You think you came because a buddy brought you. You think you're here because your parents brought you or your friend brought you. You think you're here because you were gonna watch a baptism. God brought you here that you would hear about this unbelievable free gift. The gift of saving grace and he's just going like this right now. Offering it to you. Now this brings me to number two. Saving grace is a free gift that you receive by faith. Once again, Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not even of yourselves. It's a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Beloved, Faith, believing what God has said is the key that unlocks the door to heaven. If I go out and purchase you a, a, a gift card and I come to you and say, hey, I've got a, a $1,000 gift card for you. My friend Regina is right down there. Regina, I've got a $1,000 gift card for you. And it's good for the mall. You can go to any store in the mall. All you've got to do is come up here and receive the, the, the gift card. Here's the thing. The $1,000 gift doesn't mean a thing unless she believes that what I'm saying is true. Unless she believes that I really have put $1,000 on that gift card. She might go, 
dude, he can't even afford a pair of pants, man. <laughs> I mean, really? And by the way, these are, these are supposed to be cool now. Uh, you, know, you know, there was a time in my generation when you bought pants and, and they didn't have holes in it. Now, now you buy pants that have holes in them. So that's the, that's the deal, and you, you pay a premium. For, I, I got a bunch of, I don't know, monkeys running around wearing them out, and then, and then once they get wore out, then they sell them. <laughs> and we buy them. I don't, even, I, don't even, I don't even know what that means. Anyway, the, uh, see, see, I can offer her the free gift. But so what if she goes, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe him. I don't believe there's any money on that card. I don't believe he, he'd do that for me. So you gotta, you gotta respond to that belief by, by coming and receiving it from me. You, you, gotta, you gotta respond to that gift that God offers by believing and saying, I'll take the gift. I understand the, 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 the gift. Here's the bottom line. The Bible says that salvation is a, a gift from God to you. And you either believe what the Bible says and by faith receive that gift from God, or you don't believe what the Bible says and you keep trying to make God happy by working real hard to gain his approval so that someday when you die, you hope you'll let him in, he'll, you know, you hope he'll let you into heaven. I mean, those are basically your two options. You either say, you know what? I believe and I receive the gift. Or you go, you know, I don't believe it. And then you just keep working real, real, real hard, hoping that someday when you're standing before God Almighty, he lets you in. I want you to look at those last six words of verse nine. It says, so that no one can boast. See that? So that no one can boast so that no one can boast. If, if all you could do, if you know, all you had to do was do a bunch of good works to get into heaven, if all you had to be was a good person or do a bunch of good things in your life to get into heaven, you could boast about what you did to get there. You could brag about all the good things you did to earn heaven. You, you could be up in heaven and you know, all of a sudden you're standing around with a bunch of people and hey, hey, let me tell you how I got here. I gave a lot of money away to the poor. What'd you do? Oh, man, I, I visited a whole lot of old people in convalescent hospitals. That's how I got here. Oh, really? Well, how about you? What would you do to get here? I went down to the gospel mission at least once a week, you know, and fed, fed, fed the homeless. Oh, that's a good thing. How about you? What would you do? Well, I went on five missions trips back in 2014. Oh, that's a good thing. How about you? What would you do to get to heaven? Oh, well, I, I've never murdered anybody. Well, okay, well, that's a pretty good thing. How about you? What would you do? Well, I'm an Eagle Scout. And the whole time everybody's talking about all the great things that they did to get to heaven, over there is Jesus with bloody handprints, a bloody ankles and feet where the, where the spikes were put into his feet. His head would be all bloodied and scarred because of the crown they put on it. There'd be blood coming out of the hole in his side. And we'd all look over at him and go, man, what a, what a dumb thing that was for the Father to send him. What good was him dying on a cross, man? I've been a good person my whole life. How crazy is that? And yet there are people who believe that. They believe that if I just do enough good things, man, I'm going to be in heaven. And I'll look at Jesus. Maybe, maybe they're going to say to the Father, man, what a, what a lame thing that was to send your son. Wasn't needed. I did a bunch of good things. That's just crazy thinking. And let me tell you what's every bit as crazy, every bit as blasphemous, is to say, well, yeah, Jesus did some good stuff and his blood was okay, but it wasn't enough. And so, you know, I, I had to kind of pick up the ball and run with it a little bit. I, I had to then add to what he did by, you know, being good and doing all these good things. <laughs> if that's the case, why take communion? Why remember his body and his blood? What we need to do is remember his body, his blood, and your good works. That'll never happen here at this church. We're never going to look at your good works and say, man, somehow that was a part of you being saved. But there are some churches they won't come out and say it like that, but that's what they're saying. 
Some of you, I, I, I love you. You're, you're, my, you're my church family. And not all of you like the series as I do. Not all of you like the music we do. Not all of you like how I do things around here. But let me tell you something. I love you and I care about you deeply. And I want you to get a grip on this thing called grace, at least the, the, the facet of saving grace. I want you to understand why you're going to be in heaven someday. And it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross, and he offers it to you as a free gift. And all you have to do is understand your sin, understand your, the, the condition of your heart, all you have to do is understand you can't do anything to make yourself right with God, and you receive that gift by faith. You receive Jesus Christ into your life, and you understand that it's his blood and his blood alone that cleanses you of your sin. Romans chapter 4 says, so the promise salvation is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. Now, the Bible's full of stories that illustrate this principle, this idea that, you know, God gives us what we don't deserve, blessings. And one of my favorites is found in the Old Testament in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's the story of a young disabled boy by the name of Mephibosheth. Now, here's the deal. For those of you that are young and still having babies, don't, don't ever name your child Mephibosheth. Okay? will be the last kid in his class to... You know, mem memorize his name, how to spell it. <laughs> Someone's going, oh, I already did. I named, I named my kid Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was, uh, was the son of Jonathan, which means he was the great-grandson of King Saul. And some of you know the story, but I know some of you don't. So let me kind of unpack it just for you, just a little bit for you. There was a guy by the name of Saul, and he was the king of Israel. But because he blew it, God takes his hand of blessing off of him, and he raises up a young man to be the new king. And that new king was going to be a young man by the name of David. So Saul's the king of Israel, but David's going to be the new king. So, so Saul, for lots of reasons, gets super jealous of, of David. And in fact, he, 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 he tries his best to, to kill David, chases him all over the countryside trying to kill him. But David never retaliates. In fact, he became best friends with Saul's uh, son, Jonathan, and they made a secret covenant that, that if either of them were to ever die, that they would take care of each other's family. Now, there came a moment when both King Saul and his son Jonathan were, were killed in, in battle, basically. And so now David becomes the, the, the king, and all of Saul's relatives immediately were freaked out, and, and they you know, were in fear for their lives, thinking David, who King Saul's been trying to kill his whole life, is now in control, and now he's going to come after us and kill all of us because of how crummy Saul had treated him. So you know, they all were running and hiding you know, from, from David. One of those relatives was the son of Jonathan, Meshebetheth who was terribly disabled. He had two bad legs. Well, one day, David says, he gathers all of his uh, servants together, and he says, hey, is there anybody still alive in Saul's household that I can show kindness to? Is there anybody still alive in Saul's home that I can show grace to, basically? And David's servant said, yeah, there is. There's one little kid. He's a disabled little boy named Mesebetheth, and, and, and he can't walk, and, and he really can't do anything. And David said, I want you to bring him to me. So imagine you're this boy. And all your relatives have all scrambled and they're all hiding in caves and stuff. But you, you couldn't go hide. You couldn't do anything. You're disabled. And all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and when you open it, there's a bunch of the king's soldiers standing there. You gotta be thinking to yourself, this is it, I'm a goner. The new king's gonna kill me, it's over, I'm done. But when he gets to the palace and he's standing there before King David, David said to him, Meshebetheth, I'm gonna make you part of my family. I want you to live here in the palace with me for the rest of your life. I'm going to pay all your bills. I'm going to meet all your needs. You're going to sit at my table each night and dine with me. I'm going to treat you just like you were one of my own sons. That's called grace. David's giving this boy something he doesn't deserve. This boy doesn't necessarily deserve blessings. He offers this boy a, a free gift. 
All the boy had to do was take the gift. It was free. He didn't have to come and mow the lawn or take out the trash. He didn't have to clean up his room. David just said, I'm offering you a gift, grace. If you take it, you get to come into my palace. You get to eat the best food, drink the best wine. I'll take care of your every need. Here it is. It's all yours. And what I love about this story is that it really represents all of us. We're all kind of like that boy. We're all broken, could be physically, we're broken emotionally, we're broken spiritually. Certainly all of us at one time were broken spiritually. And in the midst of our brokenness, God comes and he extends his kindness to us. He extends his grace to us and says, I'm going to bring you into my family. I want you to sit at my table. I'm going to treat you like royalty. I'm going to treat you like you're one of my own. Not because you deserve it. Not because you did anything to earn it. It's yours simply as a gift. A free gift. And all you have to do is receive it by faith. Now what's interesting is that Meshebetheth had a decision to make. He could have said, no, no, thank you, David. I don't want the gift. I don't want to come into your home. I don't want to sit at your table. I don't want to eat all the best foods and all drink all the best wines. I, I, I don't want any of that. I just want to go back to my crummy little place and live out my, my crummy existence. He could have done that. He didn't. But he could have. And God says, I want you to be a part of my, my family. I want you to come and sit at the table of Christ. I want to treat you like, like you're one of my own. I'm going to adopt you as one of my own children. I'm going to make you an heir to everything I've got. You don't, earn, you don't deserve it and you can't earn it, but I'm just going to give it to you. And for some of you, that's what God's doing right now. He's offering you a gift, unbelievable gift. And like that little boy in that story, you got a decision to make, don't you? Do I take the gift or not? See, here's the thing. The Bible says that God loves everybody. He didn't want anybody to be apart, live their eternity apart from him. He wants everybody to receive the gift. That's the heart of God. But the reality is some people don't want the gift. I know God is drawing some of you right now. The issue is, is whether you're going to humble yourself and submit yourself to the one who offers you the gift. And some of you aren't going to do that. The gift was offered to me for a long time, and I would not submit myself. I would not humble myself before God. I even acted like he didn't exist. But he was drawing me. And I believe God draws everybody. The issue is, is whether you're going to receive the gift or not. And this brings me to number three. Saving gr grace is a free gift that's received by faith and it is available to everybody. Some people don't believe that. I do. The Bible says that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all, and he richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In other words, anybody who says, I want the gift. I get it. I want the gift. God isn't going to reject. You're made in his image. Yes, sin separated you from him, but once you sense his drawing in your life, and you respond, and you call out, and say, I'll take the gift. You'll be saved. God doesn't care about your background. He doesn't care about your status in life. He doesn't care about the color of your skin. He doesn't care about how much money you got in the bank. God doesn't care about what you did last night. He doesn't care about what you did last weekend. Some of you are thinking, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. I have been a crummy, crummy guy. You're right, I don't know what you've done. All I know is this, is that God is offering you the gift. Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anybody. Doesn't matter what you've done. God says, here's a gift. 
and it's for you. Doesn't matter whether you've been a religious person or a non-religious person, God's saving grace is available to everybody. It's available to you right now. All you have to do is call out and in, and in faith receive the gift. Last night, last hour, I don't know, I counted them up, I think it was about 60 people who this weekend, by faith, received the gift for the first time. At least that's what they're telling us. I don't know whether it's true or not. Time will bear that out. But I want to give you an opportunity because I, I think God's working in some of your lives right now over in the venue. Why don't you just close your eyes for just a second, okay? Just close them. And I don't want you to pray. I just want to get you alone. Don't worry about the person sitting next to you, your husband, your wife, your kids, whatever. Don't worry about them. And I know there's a couple of blanks still to fill in, and I'm going to give you those real quick at the end here. But if you're here and you're going, you know what, I, I, I get it. You, you have, you're sensing the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your life right now. Maybe you've sensed that drawing in the past, but you've always just, your pride kept you from submitting your life to, to Jesus. And you're sensing that drawing again, and you, you want to receive the gift. This is what I want you to do. I just want you to pray this prayer in your, in your heart. And you got to mean it. I'm going to make up the prayer. The prayer's not in the Bible. It's just I'm going to make it up. And if you want to receive the gift, you want to know that your sins have been forgiven, you want to know that when you die, you're going to spend your eternity in heaven, you just pray something like this, just to say, Jesus, I get it. I understand the gift. It's free. And I'm receiving that gift right now by faith. I believe in that gift right now. Come into my life, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I want to be one of your followers now. Cleanse me of my, my sin. Now, if you're out there while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed and you prayed that prayer, obviously I can't see you on the internet or in the venue, but if you're in here and you prayed that prayer, just, just raise your hand that, 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 I, could, that I could see it and, and make sure I got it. Man, a whole bunch of you over here, a bunch of you. Man, yeah, a whole bunch of you. Yeah. Wow. Okay, everybody look up here real quick. Okay, real quick. This is what I want you to do. Our uh, hosts and hostesses are going to come down these aisles in just a second. They're going to pick up these cards, and you've got your name on them, and I'm a first-time guest, I'm a second-time guest, I'm whatever. And um, you got your prayer request on there. Everybody's going to turn those in. And those of you that raised your hand, you raised your hand over in the venue, all I want you to do is just put a little star up in the corner like these people did. Just put a little star up there, and those cards will come to me. Before I leave here today... They'll be sorted out, and I'll have all these cards, and I'm going to take these cards home with me, and on Monday, tomorrow, I'm, I, I'm going to send you something, I don't know, in the email, I don't know, snail mail, if you don't have an email address, and I just want to congratulate you on your decision, and, and I want to help you maybe understand a little bit about what this decision means, and I want to invite you to something. You don't have to come if you don't want, but I want to invite you to something, and I'm not going to show up at your door, Hi! You put a star in your card, and here I am. I, I, that's not going to happen. That'd be weird. But, but, but I, I want to know, okay? So just grab that pin in front of you and put a star on there. And right now, everybody turn those cards in. Everybody pass those cards in. Right now, right now. Just pass them towards the center aisle, and the host and hostesses are going to pick those, those cards up. Okay, right now, do that. Pass them in. Pass them in right now. And this is what I want to do. I want you to pay attention. Just pass the, the card and then focus on me, okay? Because this, this last part is every bit as important as the first part. Now what? In light of what God has done for you, in light of the fact that God has offered you a free gift, in light of the fact that all you had to do is by faith receive this gift, how should you respond to this incredible idea of grace? How should you respond, Christian? Well, I'm going to give you three things real quick, okay? Number one, 
You can show your gratitude for God's grace by making your one life count. Now I want you to pay close attention. L -l listen to me. This is where things get all goofy, is if you don't listen to this part. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your, your body is where God's Holy Spirit lives, who is in you, whom you've received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Therefore, honor God with your body. Beloved, there's no way that you could possibly understand this beautiful facet of God's grace, that it's a free gift, and all you have to do is receive it by faith, and then go out and live a crummy life. If you're out there living a crummy, sinful life, you do not understand the saving grace of God. I don't care what you tell me. To know that when you invited God into your life, that he came and lives inside of you, you're the temple of, of the Holy Spirit of God, and yet you're out there living in blatant sin? No way. How you demonstrate your gratefulness for this incredible gift is that you make your one life count. I love how Eugene Peterson put it in the message, he says, don't you see that you keep, can't keep on living however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? So let people see God in and through your body. Wow, isn't that good? I hadn't read the, the message in a long time, but I read that version of it, and man, it sure made a passage that I've read a zillion times come to life in a whole new way. You can't understand the grace of God and just keep on ignoring his commands. You can't understand the grace of God and just keep on wasting your time on trivia or keep on spending your, your money any way you think you, you want. You, you can't do it anymore. You've been bought with a price. Look, I beg you, don't waste your life. Christ died for it. And one of the ways you show God gratitude is when you make your one life count. Number two, you can show your gratitude for God's grace by living a generous life. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, Each man, each woman should give what he has decided to give in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And you ought to circle those alls, all grace, all things, all times, having all that you need. Those are the promises related to the person who becomes like Christ. And what was Christ like? He was a giver, wasn't he? He gave up his life for us. He gave up his life for us and offers his life as a gift. You will never be more like Jesus than when you're giving, when you're giving your time, when you're giving your talents, when you're giving your treasures. Christ was a, 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 a giver, you ought to be a giver. Look, if you get all uptight when somebody starts talking about giving or you get defensive or you get stingy or you get nervous, it means you don't understand his grace and you have some maturing to do because a mature Christian who understands this gift a pleasure they do give cheerfully and last but not least you can show your gratitude for God's grace by sharing the good news of God's grace with others look somebody told you about the grace of God and now it's your turn you're now called to tell somebody else about the about the very uh, grace of God inside your program we've given you one of these cards and if you were here last weekend, we had you fill these cards out. I took a few off of the, the wall today. Our prayer wall out there has thousands of names on it. And if you weren't here, you ought to put the name of somebody on that card who you would say, I'm going to pray that they'll come with me to our, one of our Easter gatherings. You see, Easter is one of those times when people will come to church. And I, I, I'll tell you, Somebody challenged me on this a little bit ago. I don't care. I think it's sinful 
that you heard about the grace of God and you received that gift and now you don't tell anybody about it. Now you can come up and say, you know, I don't think so. I don't think it's that big a deal. You, you can do that if you want. But you're wrong. You don't understand the grace of God if you don't share it with somebody else. And Easter is one of those great moments where we say, look, we're going to spend a month praying for all of these people. We're going to pray for the guy that mows your lawn. We're going to pray for the, the person who combs your hair and cuts your hair. We're going to pray for the person that comes and does your pool. We're going to pray for the person who, who cleans your home. We're going to pray for the, the guy that delivers your mail. We're going to pray for the person who picks up your trash. We're going to pray for that person who works in the cubicle next to you. We're going to pray for that person who plays in your foursome on the golf course. We're going to pray for that person that you play tennis with. We're going to pray for that lost family member. You you need to put their name on this card and go out there and put it on that wall. And we as a staff gather at that wall all the time. We're going to be praying for those names. We're going to be believing with you that God's going to bring them here. And maybe at Easter, they'll give their life to Christ. Last Easter, we had over 100 people who came forward in an altar call and gave their life to Christ. Some of them were your friends. Maybe it wasn't your friend. Invite them again. And maybe this is the year they'll come forward. But how tragic if you're not praying for somebody and inviting somebody. You need, you need to do that. And I always tell you, look, before you talk to your friends about God, you always talk to God about your friends. It always begins by praying. So go out to that wall, put your names on there, first names, and let's just believe that God's going to fill this place up on Easter. In fact, let me just tell you, the Wednesday before Easter, we're having what we call the upper room experience in here. We're going to create, recreate what took place in the upper room. We're going to do some foot washing. And some of you are going, oh, man, what? That's sick. That's gross. I, I'm not going to do that. Oh, man. And then what I want you to do is, is think about this. Jesus did it. <laughs> Jesus did it. Yeah, it is kind of sick and gross to think about, isn't it? The Son of God did it. And we'll have a section for guys, a section for gals, a section for couples. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of lay it out for you. You'll see how it works. It's really, really kind of a beautiful thing. We'll have communion together that night. And that's a night for believers to come. That's Wednesday night. And then Friday, we have our Good Friday services at noon and 7 and those are about 50 minutes long, and they're way different than any other Good Friday service in town, guarantee it. There's no pulpit, there's no preaching, we're going to set this place up way different, the cross will be in the middle, and it's just way different. But I guarantee you, you'll have an unbelievable time with the Lord. And then the weekend comes, and that's when we as believers party, right? I mean, if there was ever a time to party, it's when we celebrate the fact that Jesus walked out of the tomb and we have a Saturday at 4, a Saturday at 6. We have a Sunday morning at 9, Sunday at 11. We have a, our, uh, our sunrise service out by the, the cross. Our Spanish-speaking ministry has a service. We have six gatherings. And the reason why we put all these gatherings on is because we want to make room for you and those who need to know about this, the free gift. And so we want you, our church family, to know about those, pray, pray about those things. Next week in your program, we'll have some things that you can take home or whatever. You can go to our website and see more of the details on this. But one of the ways that you express your, your gratitude to God for the grace of God in your life is when you tell others about that grace. Why don't you stand over in the venue? Why don't you stand and let, let me pray? And Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. A lot of people, God, have made professions of faith this weekend. They've received the gift. And now, Lord, the hard work of the church begins, and that's discipling these people. <laughs> You're the one who draws people to yourself. You do all the saving. And then the church is here to disciple them, to help them learn about you, what it means to be a follower, and help us, God. Help us to be faithful to all these names, care about them, love them. And Father, I um, just want to thank you for this incredible gift that you've offered to everybody 
the grace of God, the saving grace of God. May we live differently because we understand it. Blessings on all that we do today, God, and I pray this in your name. Amen.